we wanted to make sure that we honored the Lord and uh, honored their hard work, and uh, they did so much to try to uh, to get this ready, and uh, so th- I'm thankful for them. Take your Bibles, if you would, and turn to the book of Romans for me, if you would, as we get into the, uh, uh, the message this morning. We only got through about a third of the message last week, so uh, we're, we're going to continue on uh, as we look at the verses 1 through 4 of Romans chapter 1. Uh, we're going to go ahead and read those this morning, and uh, take a, taking a closer look um, at the whole book of Romans, what it's about, why it was written to them, and, and why God has given it to us. Uh, Romans chapter 1, 1 through 4, uh, starts by this. Verse 1, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God, which he had promised before by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Verse 5 says this, By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations, for his name. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this day. I thank you, Lord, for for your word. Lord, I thank you for the truth that we can gather from, uh, from, from your word. And it's not just the knowledge, but God, how it affects us. Lord, the truth that's there for each one of us. I pray, God, that you speak to us. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Lord, may our spirits be tender to the moving of, of, of your word and, and your spirit. And uh, Lord, I pray that you're glorified in all that's uh, said and done this morning. Thank you and ask you for, for your help because I need it. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I mentioned last week uh, that... Uh, that the, the Lord had laid on my heart as we were getting ready. The, the theme of, of this year uh, was, uh, for me, the, the word faith, the Lord's laid it upon my heart. Many times we think about faith and, and living by faith, and uh, uh, we think of, uh, of a belief, uh, trusting in something that, uh, that, uh, that God's going to take care of all things. Just have faith. Uh, but faith is, is much more than that. In fact, our, our faith is based upon how we feel. Our, ba- our faith isn't based upon the things that we want. Our faith is based upon the Word of God. Uh, uh, we can't just feel something about something because our feelings are, as I mentioned this last week, our feelings are fickle. They can, they can change. One day uh, we'll feel one way, the next day we'll be unsure of that. And, and we, we can't uh, base our faith upon our circumstances because our circumstances are always changing. But what we can do is we can base our faith on something that's sure, a foundation that never moves, a foundation that we can trust, something that we know uh, will, will be there uh, until the very end of days. And the Bible tells us that God's Word is that for us. The book of Romans uh, is, is uh, the account of uh, the gospel. Uh, the, uh, as I mentioned last week, the, the first three chapters uh, talk about the, the uh well, it's a book about the gospel. Uh, uh, but in the gospel, we, we find several things. We find that it, the first three chapters talks about uh, and deals with man's sinfulness. And the truth is, we are sinful. Uh, and and I, I saw this quote. A friend of mine, a pastor down in New Hampshire, uh, posted this. It says, we cannot see the beauty of the, of the gospel until we see, see the, 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 the wickedness in our own selves. We can't truly appreciate beauty and uh, the beauty of it, uh, the, the, the grace of it, the, the blessing of it, unless we truly see our need for the gospel. It, it, we can stand here and say that we have the good news all that we want, but that good news means nothing to somebody that doesn't see a need for it in their lives. So chapters 1 through 3 deal with sin. Chapters 4 and 5 tell us about salvation and how we can be saved Chapter 6 through 8 tells us about sanctification and the work of God in our lives and how he changes us uh, uh, through the grace of God, through his work in our lives. Chapter 9 through 11 deals with the sovereignty of God. And verse uh, chapter 12 uh, and, and on deals with service. And, and we think about uh, how our faith, that our faith is, is important to us. Our faith is, is something that we can cling to, but our faith is something that's supposed to have an effect on our lives. It doesn't do us any good to say that we believe something and never act 
have it act out in our lives. It's necessary uh, to, 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 to live a certain way, and Scripture tells us how we're to live, but if we don't have a solid foundation in which we stand on, we'll not have any foundation which will drive us or move us to live our lives in a way that brings honor and glory to God. And as I look at the, the, my sinfulness, as I look at uh, the grace of God and what Christ did for me uh, in my life and how he changed me, that, that drives me. Paul says it like this, the love of Christ constrains me. That, uh, that, uh, that, that, that if one died for all, Christ died for us, that we all should live for him. And the reason we live for him is because of what he did. We owe him so much because of what Christ did for us on that cross. Last week, we, we looked at the author of this book, and I understand that Paul was the author. It's not disputed. The very first verse identifies that he was the author. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. And it's like, uh, he's identified, uh, but we understand who he was before. He was Saul before he was Paul. We, we talked about last week uh, who he was prior to his salvation. Uh, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Uh, 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 he was an educated man. He had sat underneath uh, a, a religious scholar, uh, Gamaliel, who was one of the highest known scholars of his day. Uh, uh, he uh, had power. He had authority. But he lost it all. And when I say he lost it all, it wasn't taken from him. He gave it up the day that he met Christ on the cross. We talked we mentioned some things that we see here in this verse, verse 1, uh, uh, about Saul. We talked about how he was a saved man. He, uh, uh, Saul means big. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if he was named after King Saul, but uh, he and, and King Saul had some, some similarities. They, they were men of pride. They were men of authority. They, they, they were big people, but, but Saul became Paul. The word Paul means little. He went from being uh, somebody of importance to understanding that without God, he is nothing. And the truth is, we, we, we all are in the same position. We are all in need of salvation, but that salvation changed him, uh, and not just his name. And, and his name actually didn't change when he got saved. Uh, uh, he was known as Saul for, for quite a, a while up until his missions. But, but as you follow him, uh, he went from being uh, uh, the, the least of, of the apostles to he called himself the least of all saints. In fact, uh, uh, he said he was the worst of sinners. Uh, so, so we understand that as he grew and, and matured in his Christian li life, in his Christian walk, the more he understood about himself, the more he realized that he wasn't what he used to be. He was a saved man. Uh, his life had changed. He went from, from counting everything that he, who he was and what he had accomplished as, as important to uh, the book of Philippians says that he counted it as done. That it was a loss to him, that it mean, meant nothing to him. Uh, that, that he would give, give it all up, and he did give it all up to know Jesus Christ. So he was a, a saved man. He was a surrendered man. He was called to be an apostle. But before that, it says he was a servant. It's the, word, uh, the, 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 the Greek word there means slave. And again, we, we look at slavery as, uh, to, in, according to our history, but it was talking about indentured servitude. And he understood that as a, uh, as a saved person, that he was a servant of Jesus Christ. He was submitting himself uh, unto the Lord and, and allowing God to, 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 uh, to, to lead his life. And he gladly did it because of what Christ had, did, had done for him. And the truth is we all need to be servants of Jesus Christ. So he was a saved man, he was a, he was a, a submitted man, but not only was he a submitted man, he was a sent man. The, it says he was an apostle, an apostle was one who was sent out, and he went out uh, to, to preach the gospel to, to every creature. He uh, uh, was an apostle to the Gentiles, he had a desire to share this truth, this truth that changed his life uh, with, with those who had never heard it uh, before. And as Paul was sent out, so were we. We are, we are all called, according to Romans chapter 1, verse 6, which we didn't read, we are all called to go and tell others about Jesus Christ. We are the called of Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad that, that God knew you before you were born, before you, while you were in your mother's womb, the Bible tells us. Uh, the Bible, he said that, uh, David says that in Psalms 139. Uh, Jeremiah sa it says it of Jeremiah in, 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 Jer in the book of Jeremiah. The same is true for each and every one of us. God knew you. He knows the number of hairs on your head. He knows, uh, he knows your strengths. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your talents. He gave it all to you. And he knows you. Which tells me he knows the good things about us. We like people to know the good things about us. But he also knows the things that we're not so proud of. 
things that we try to hide. Which, well, that's a terrifying thing to know that there's nothing that we can hide from the eyes of God. The Bible says uh, uh, of David uh, that, that, that he was a man after God's own heart. And, and when Samuel had, uh, came to him, he says, God looks on the outward appearance, or man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. God sees our hearts, our innermost thoughts, who we are, what we have done. That's kind of terrifying. Because <laughs> I can put on a front and I can show everybody who I want them to think I am, but God sees who I really am. And while it's slightly terrifying, what, what blesses me beyond all measure is that God knows me at my worst, and he still loves me. But God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He doesn't require me to change, my, change who I am. He changes who I am through salvation and through the work of sanctification. He doesn't require anything of me other than to come to him, to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are called, and we're sent out. We're sent out. We're all to- told to, 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 to be the, the preachers of the gospel. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, the Bible tells us. He was also a, a separated man. It says there in verse 1, at the end of it, it says, separated unto the gospel of God. Now that word separate, we, we think of uh, taking one thing away from something else. And I mentioned this last week. Uh, uh, it's not that we're necessarily just separated from something. Uh, many times we think of, of religion, we think of uh, a set of rules that we, uh, we're not allowed to do this, and we're not allowed to do this, and none of the fun things that we're allowed to do. But that's not what it's about. Yes, there are things that we shouldn't do as children of God, but it says we're separated unto something. Meaning, not that we're just taken away from something, but we're separated unto something. God. We're separated unto. Uh, yes, we leave the world behind, but we're going to something better. Uh, if I were to come to you and, and you're driving a, a broken down old, old uh, Ford or Chevy or whatever it is you have with rust holes and barely, barely starts, and I said, hey, listen, you should just get rid of that car. You say, but that's the only car I have. Well, here, I got something better. Here's a, here's a Ferrari. I bet you you take it. You're, you're trading up, right? Guess what? We trade it up. When we got saved, yes, I, I left my, uh, who I was. I left the life that I, was, uh, that I had before. Uh, uh, that was worthless. But what I got is so much better. Uh, uh, there was, uh, I am so thankful for what God has done in my life and the work that he has done in me in making me his child. Uh, I didn't deserve it. Uh, I didn't earn it. There was nothing that, that I received of it. But, but God did it for me because he loves me. So I'm separated, yes, but I'm separated unto Jesus Christ. And I'm separated unto the gospel of God. And here specifically, it's talking about Paul being separated unto the gospel. See, he left everything he was behind to the ministry of preaching the gospel. Paul's life changed on that day. He he went from being one who persecuted the church uh, 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 years later, I'm sure the, what he did must have haunted him, must have followed him, must have been in his dreams. Uh, I mean, uh, as, as you look back in the book of Acts and you see how he, uh, how he tortured and uh, how he was arresting people, taking them from their homes, how, how he led the charge and, and, uh, and, and taking Stephen, uh, uh, one, of the, one of the deacons of the church, as he was preaching, uh, uh, taking him, dragging him out and having him stoned to death. What a, what a terrible thing to think back as he sat there and those, that, that guilt weighed upon him. But, but how much joy he must have found when he wrote Romans chapter 8, but there is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Realizing what he used to be and what what, what he had been now, his life has changed. He wasn't like that anymore. He went from being the persecutor of the church to one who planted the uh, churches, one one who persecuted and and disbelieved and denied the gospel to one who trusted in the gospel and preached the gospel and said, if this this isn't true, then I am of all, all men most miserable. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And we need to be separated. Separated from what we used to be unto what God has made us to be, what God has desired us to be. That was last week, and none of that was today's message. Just a reminder. Look back at Romans chapter 1, look at verse 2 with me. I want to read 2 through 4. It says, Which he had promised before by his pro prophets in the holy scriptures concerning his son jesus christ our lord which was made of the seed of david according to the flesh and declared to be the son of god with power 
according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. We looked at the author of this book of Romans, but I want you to notice uh, who this book is truly about, the hero of the book of Romans. Verse 3 says, well, verse 2 and 3 says this, that the gospel, the promises, the, the gospel of God at the end of verse 1, which was promised before by the prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his Son. See, the, the hero of the book is Jesus Christ. The hero of the Word of God is, there, there are all kinds of, uh, of, of big names that if I, if I mention them, you would remember them. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. King Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel, David, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. and go through all the, all the apostles' names. See, I remember those names. It wasn't about any of those men. While all their, 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 their lives are, are recorded and accounted in this word, this book that we have in your, that you hold in your hands, this book that we cling to, it isn't about their lives. This book, the, the, the central theme of this book is God and his creation of man, his love for man, man's sin, and how God re- reconciles or brings back that relationship that he intended for you and I. And that was Jesus Christ. It's all about Christ. He is the central theme from Genesis to the book of Revelations. Jesus is the central theme, uh, the, 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 the hero, the one this is all about. Notice the, there in verse number two, he is the promised one. The gospel of God, which he had prom- at the end of verse one, which he had promised afore by the prophets of his holy scriptures. Paul's talking about the holy scriptures. He didn't have the books that he had written yet, uh, he, or the, the, the letters that he had written yet. Or the, uh, he didn't have the gospels. Uh, all, uh, they, they weren't recorded at this point in time. Uh, what he had was the Old Testament prophecies uh, from, from uh, the, the books of Abraham, uh, 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 Genesis through, through Deuteronomy, uh, uh, the, the books of Joshua. He, he had uh, all the, the, the small prophets, the large prophets. That's what he had in his hands. He says they were holy scriptures. One of the ways that we know that Christ is the Messiah is because that his life fulfilled the prophecies of the, those Old Testament scriptures. He was promised thousands of years before he was ever born. And we could look back, I always said that he would be born in the city of Bethlehem, that he would be born to a virgin. We could look at all of those Old Testament prophecies and we can see them fulfilled one after the other after the other. Many times, in, and I believe it's in the book of Matthew, you'll see, uh, as it is written, uh, it, was, it was showing that what, what happened here fulfilled a specific prophecy in that Old Testament. So seeing that, we understand that Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of that, meaning Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the promised one. There's no way that these prophecies could have ever been by, fulfilled by accident. Sometimes, uh, sometimes uh, things happen by accident. I don't believe there are any accidents, to be honest with you. But you can say, well, well yes, he matches this, this person matches this, and this person could match this. Jesus Christ fulfilled all of them. There's no way it's possible. You'd have a better chance of winning the Mega Millions. Actually, somebody did. If you did, I expect the tithe in this week. I'm kidding. I wouldn't want all that money. Though it is t- it, the, the, Satan's had it long enough. I'm just kidding. It was Christ that fulfilled all those prophecies. Every single one. It, it lends, it lends uh, weight to the argument that he was the Messiah. In fact, when Paul would deal with the Jews, uh, he, wouldn't, he would take them through the Old Testament in the book of Acts when, when uh, Philip uh, is talking to the Ethiopian eunuch as he sat in his chariot and reading through a passage in the Old Testament trying to figure out what this meant. The passage was Isaiah chapter 53. Fulfilling, turn over there real quick, let's look at it. Isaiah chapter 53, one of my favorite passages, one of the clearest pictures of Jesus Christ. This is, who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness when, he shall, when we shall see him, and there is no beauty that we should desire him. He's despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were our faces from him. 
He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our uh, iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from the prison and from judgment. Who shall declare his generations? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence. Neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put to him, him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. I love this verse, he shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. That, that Ethiopian eunuch reading this passage of scripture couldn't understand what it's talking about, and the Bible says that Philip took him from where he was and he preached to him Jesus. Jesus is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecy, and by that we know that he was the promised one. John 5, 39, Jesus says this, Search the Scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Jesus Christ himself said that the, the, the Scriptures, the, the holy written word of God, was that which testified of him. He was the promised one. Not only was he the promised one, he's the provided one. Again, this is concerning a son, verse 3, uh, concerning a son, Jesus Christ, Lord, which was made the seed of David according to the flesh and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of his dead. As it says that he was the seed of David, it's talking about his humanness, his rightful uh, ascend, uh, he was a rightful descendant of the throne of David. If you look through the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 1, it gives us the, uh, his, uh, his uh, humanly heritage. The promise was that it would be David's throne that reigned forever. And guess who will sit on that throne one day? Jesus Christ. So, but it's declaring his humanity. And, and we, uh, the Bible teaches us that, yes, he is God. And we'll mention that in just a moment. We'll look more into that in just a second. But he was man, fully man. Which means he, he, was, he's, he was tempted and tried like we are. He, was, he got weak. He got hungry. He got tired. He had to take naps or go to sleep. Listen, he was man. And if he wasn't, he couldn't have died for us. But not only was he man, he was also God. He was provided for us. He was the God-man. We cannot take away his humanity that he took on himself. He, Philippians 2 says he took, put upon him the form of a man. We cannot deny his humanity. We cannot deny his deity. He was born to a virgin into this world. He's the provided one. It says in verse 3, uh, not only was he made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, this verse 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power. He was made, he was born, man. But he's provided as the Son of God. Jesus Christ existed before this world ever did. John chapter 1, verse 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Later on in verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. See, Jesus Christ wasn't a thought. He wasn't an idea. He wasn't a, 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 some principle that God had, would, would, had declared that one day would take place. Uh, the book of Revelation tells us that before the foundations of the, the, the world was laid, that the Lamb of God was slain. He was already existed. In fact, uh, Colossians tells us that he had his hand in creation. So does John chapter 1. Uh, and in fact, it tells us that not only did he have his hand in creation, but the world continues to exist today because of the power that, that was rested in Jesus Christ. And he is the powerful one. Verse 4 says, And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Through his resurrection, 
See, the truth is everybody dies. Even those that Christ himself raised from the dead. Think of Lazarus. Think of uh, Jairus' daughter. Uh, uh, they, they, they were risen from the dead uh, through the power of Jesus Christ. But one day they took their final breath and they died. And that day that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you and I, uh, he was taken off that cross. He was placed in, into uh, the grave of another. And, and he was there for three days. But three days later, he got up. And I don't mean he woke up. I mean he rose from the dead. And through that, through that resurrection of the dead, his, he has declared God by power. 1 Corinthians 15, that he showed himself alive by many infallible proofs. Uh, he revealed himself to more than 500 people. Uh, uh, there was a greater eyewitness, more eyewitnesses accounts of, of Jesus Christ after his resurrection than there is of any other. There's more proof of the resurrection historically than there is of anything else that we can find. Paul says that he wants to know Christ. Paul says that he wants to, 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 to see, the, the, to, to fellowship with him in the sufferings, but ultimately he wants to, 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 to understand and, and feel this power of the resurrection. And the truth is, one day we all can. Because the power that raised him from the dead is the same power that gives us spiritual life. There would be no hope of, of salvation. There would be no hope of heaven if there was not a faith and a hope in the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If he never resurrected from the dead, there would be no hope. That's what 1 Corinthians 15 says. That we would be of all men most miserable. That if there was no resurrection of the dead, then everything falls like a, like a, like a set of dominoes. That, 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 that everything that was taught was a lie. Everything that we believed was, was false. And, and, and we would have absolutely no hope. But I love how it ends. That, that, that section says, but he is risen. He is risen. He is alive. And we do have hope because of Jesus Christ. He is the provided one. He is the powerful one. He's also the pure one. Verse 4 says, in Acts, in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. The Lord was... That's the wrong verse. The Bible tells us this, that he who knew no sin became sin for us. Jesus Christ was sinless. He was, he was the pure one. Pure in his humanity, while tempted, while, while, while tempted uh, in every way like we are, the Bible tells us, he did it yet without sin. If he wasn't pure, he would not have been the spotless Lamb of God, which was required for, the, for, the, uh, sal for our salvation. The wrath of God, he, Isaiah 53 said that the wrath of God was satisfied because of, because of his sacrifice. Hebrews 7, 6, 7 verse 6 says, But he whose des descent is not counted from them receives tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had promises. For such an high priest became us who, in holy harm who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. That is Jesus Christ. Now Jesus Christ is the theme of the entire book. He is the, the hero of this book. But the subject of the book of Romans is the gospel. And I remind you this, that as the theme is all about Christ, so is the gospel. Verse 1 of Romans 1 says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated under the gospel of God. This book is about the gospel. It did not originate uh, in some denomination. It wasn't a, a thought. It wasn't a, a theory. It, it says it's the gospel of God. As the angels declared, the kids, the kids uh, in the program today talked about how the angels said, uh, peace and, and, and to, to the world, and, uh, peace to all the earth, uh, good news. Uh, listen, the good news was that the Savior had finally come. But again, it's all about Jesus. This gospel that Paul preached, he didn't receive 
from men. He didn't receive it from books. Gamaliel didn't teach him. He received it from Jesus Christ himself. Galatians chapter 1, verse 12 says, For I neither received it of a man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 9 says this, as we, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that you have received, let him be a be a curse. There is a danger today that we misunderstand what the gospel is. There are a lot of different people that think there are a lot of different ways to get to heaven. Some people believe that you can earn your way there, that there's some kind of weight balance where they weigh your good works by your, uh, and your bad works. But it's not just that. It has to do with our nature, who we really are. And so this, this false understanding this, uh, it thinks pe- it makes people believe that they can do something to, to earn it. They can do enough good, but try that at a, at going before a judge in court. Well, yeah, judge, I know I was speeding through that school zone, but I volunteer at the nursing home once a week. That's good. But now you're going to go to jail. So they're going to have to fill your position. Why? Because you broke the law. Well, we broke the law of God. And even more of that, we do that because of who we are. Uh, it says in the book of Romans, and, uh, it, it, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the, in, into the world, and death by sin, so the death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Do you know why you sin? Because you're a sinner. It's our nature. It, it, it's not that there's some bad people and, and some worse people, and then there's some good people. Church people aren't good people. We're just people saved by grace. We don't, we're not better than anybody else. Please, ho- I hope you don't think that of yourself or think that of us. We're not. We're all in need of the grace of God. We're all in need of the work of God in us, for the forgiveness of God. We all fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The gospel is good news because of where we are, who we are. We need to understand that Jesus himself said, uh, uh, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. It isn't through our good works. It isn't through our coming to church. I'm glad you're all here. Uh, uh, but it, isn't, uh, it doesn't come because you, you put your tithes in the, bo- in the box back there. It doesn't, it, uh, your salvation isn't based upon uh, how you dress. It isn't based upon uh, uh, the language that you use. It's not based upon anything that has to do with you. It's based upon what Jesus Christ did for us. So understand, this subject of the gospel is all about Jesus Christ. Notice verse 3, it says says that it's concerning his son. That word concerning means it's enveloping or surrounding or all around Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the center of the gospel. Understand what what we just said. Jesus Christ is the center of the gospel. One of the problems uh, in, in talking to others about about our faith many times is we invite them to come to church. We invite them to do this. We invite them to do this. What they need is Christ. They need Jesus Christ. They need to see Christ in you. They need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ from our lips, but they need Jesus Christ. We need to be very careful that we don't pervert or tamper with that gospel. Galatians 1, 6-7 says this, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Uh, this is a, a letter written by Paul to the church in Galatia. Uh, uh, these are people that had, had come to faith in Jesus Christ. And after Paul had left, some, some had risen up in the church or somebody had come in, some had come from outside of the church and they began to teach that you had to follow the law, the Jewish law, uh, the law of circumcision. That if you were truly going to be saved, you have to be circumcised. That's not what the Bible tells us. That's not what Paul taught. But, but many of these were Jews, and they were confused, and they were, uh, this, so the gospel was being perverted. We need to be very careful that we understand that there is a false gospel out there. Now, I don't think there's anybody going around telling you, well, if you're not circumcised, then, then, then you can't be a Christian, not, not in today's day, but there's still a perversion of the gospel. There is, a, uh, there is a prosperity gospel that if you just, you can manifest it, God wants you to be wealthy and rich and 
I don't see that anywhere in Scripture, ever. Not to say that to have money or to have wealth is a sin. The Bible says it's the love of money that's the root of all evil. And there were times, uh, Paul said himself, that there were times when he abounded, when he had much. And there were other times when he was abased. But it really comes down to the fact that, that we need to be content in whatever it is that God gives us. But it, it has, that has nothing to do with the gospel. It is Christ that saves us. There are those that believe that, that all roads lead to heaven. That's not true either. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He also said that the, narrow is, the road is narrow and hard, and there are few that find it. So Christ is the source of the gospel, or is the, is the center of the gospel, the subject of it. But the source of the gospel is God. We see it in verse 1 and in verse 3. Paul, a servant of Christ, that Jesus Christ called to be an apostle, separated of the gospel of God, concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was made of the seed of David.